All right, sorry, I know it's been a while since I've done this, but let's talk about some video game news, starting with probably this week's biggest development, which is the success of the new Fallout show, which is just incredible. If you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend it. Very clearly to me, one of the best video game adaptations ever been done. I say that sincerely. I say that as someone who's generally very skeptical of video game adaptations, whether it's to film or to TV. I'm generally someone who comes down a lot harsher on those types of things, but Fallout just really knocks it out of the park. But don't take my word for it, let's take a look over here at Digital Trends Review, which says Amazon's Fallout TV series is even more impressive than The Last of Us, which is already a pretty big claim. Last of Us, an award-winning show, you know, not just by video game standards, but by television and Hollywood industry standards, a critically acclaimed show uh, winning multiple awards. This article is by Giovanni Colantonio, um, who just goes on to basically say a nice things about the adaptation. Um, you know, saying initially he was skeptical. I was also very skeptical about the show. If you caught my last uh, episode of Context Club with Mike Williams, you know that I really thought that, that nothing could beat Silo in terms of a post-apocalyptic fiction. And I think Fallout just, the show, nails the tone and the elements of the game and the style and the look just so perfectly. Here's what he has to say. If you're still skeptical uh, about Fallout, I can't blame you. The current wave of hype around it almost feels too far in the other direction at present. It's certainly not something you classify as prestige TV. And I think that's referring to kind of some of the campiness that's in the show, that's in the Fallout series throughout, uh, playing more like a tamer attempt to capitalize on Amazon's The Boys. It's silly too, it's silly, hyper, hyper violent and meandering at times as characters walk through the wasteland to their next objective, like a game character traveling to a quest marker. But if you like video games, that's actually exciting to see in a show. Uh, and then Colin Antonio goes on to say, even with those critiques, Fallout should be celebrated for what it accomplishes just as much as The Last of Us was at release. And I wholeheartedly agree with this. It's a thoughtful way to adapt a genre that doesn't easily lend itself to other media formats. A success like this should be blueprint should be a blueprint going forward, reminding creators to never stop playing with the games they're adapting. So. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with this, and we'll, we can get into it a little bit more. And there's other things I want to talk about that the Fallout show does. Um, here's another post from uh, Games Radar from Emily Garbutt, who says, Fans are calling the Fallout TV show one of the best video game adaptations ever, like I just did, and critics agree, judging by its near-perfect Rotten Tomatoes score. Um, that's correct. The Rotten Tomatoes score um, is very high. 93% on the tomato meter and an 88% from the audience. It's really awesome to see a video game adaptation do this well. Um, and of course, that's led to more Fallout sales. And I wasn't sure this was gonna be super effective without a more recent Fallout game being released. Fallout 76 was released years ago. Um, and it was, uh, it had a lot of troubles at launch and eventually it felt like Bethesda was able to kind of pull it around to a game that people like to play in, in a world that people enjoyed being in and kind of having like a water cooler game, but specifically for Fallout fans, they kind of missed the, the, the big wave of people getting excited about a Fallout game the way they traditionally do for like a Fallout 3 or a New Vegas or a Fallout 4. And, and then it kind of just seemed to be the diehard fans that, that picked up 76, but now, um, because of the show, Fallout has more than doubled its player counts on Steam. That's according to Vicky Blake on Eurogamer, who says, rad. Uh, in the story, it reads, Fallout 4 is currently sitting in SteamDB's top 20 Steam database, which tracks uh, analytics on Steam, who's playing what. Uh, Fallout 4 is currently sitting in Steam's, uh, SteamDB's top 20 games by concurrent numbers, making it one of the most popular games on Steam the over the weekend. But it's not just Fallout 4 that's seen a resurgence in players. Fallout 76 and Fallout New Vegas have similarly seen their concurrent player base increase since the TV series debate, de debuted on the streaming channel uh, last week. And yeah, I think I watched the whole series in probably two days. Two days, I think it took me to, to get through all eight episodes. Um, and yeah, here's the numbers from SteamDB. You can see kind of where the games were before. And yeah, nearly doubling and tripling. Uh, this green line is Fallout 4. The uh, red line here is Fallout 76. That's the multiplayer Fallout game, the most recent kind of main Fallout game, which is a multiplayer game. And then there's Fallout New Vegas, which is a, a very well beloved, like uh, critical hit, right? There's Fallout fans who just feel that this game is the best, best game, um, best Fallout game in the series. It's made by Obsidian, not by Bethesda. 
um, but it is considered canon and, and people do like it. We can talk a little bit more about that later too. So yeah, it says the concurrent pink of all three games have double, tripled, and even quadrupled as the show shines a light on Bethesda's tentpole series. And the show really did remind me what I like about the Fallout games originally and that first time experiencing Fallout 3. And I mean, I tried to really get into Fallout 4, but I kind of fell off. But the show just really does capture the magic of that world, the kind of the world building that Bethesda obviously is known for, but to see that kind of portrayed in such a, uh, a loving way on this on the small screen, I guess you would call it, is just really inspiring to see. The main character, Lucy, as you're kind of following her, she's kind of exploring and, and understanding this world for the first time and learning the rules and stuff and going through that is like a similar experience, I think, that, that players picking up a Fallout game for the first time kind of experience. And they did a really, really good job letting that character be a window for, for the viewers and for people who have played the games originally uh, to kind of experience it all over again. And it's really cool. Anyways, yeah, there's a there's a thing down here about how Todd Howard previously said the Fallout TV show is canon and said after the events of the games released so far, but the TV show's sixth episode includes a contradictory date. This has to do with one of the towns um in fallout in the show and reference to new vegas which kind of gets referenced in different ways there's a if you want to read that story it's on Eurogamer, um and you can check it out there's a link to it at the bottom of this story fallout has more than doubled its player counts in steam so you can just google that if you want or i'll put a link in the description so we talked about the sales they're blowing up um yes fallout 76 hits a new concurrent player record it's more of the same hey this article is written by evan campbell on GameSpot, I swear I didn't do that on purpose. There's another Evan Campbell who works at GameSpot and writes news. I oftentimes get confused with him. Uh, but yeah, he wrote this article. It's not me, it's a different person, I swear. Um, but yeah, so additionally, Fallout 76 is free for a week on PC, PlayStation, Xbox. Very cleverly, Bethesda, uh, the publisher of the Fallout games and creator of the Fallout games, uh, they release, or not the original creators, but the current owners of the license and everything. They knew that interest was coming. If the show popped off, we saw this with The Witcher, we saw this with The Last of Us, then people would go out and buy these games or try to re-experience them, experience them again, or new people per, per chance checking these games out. But here's the Fallout franchise sale page on Steam. And yeah, Fallout 76, you can get it for eight bucks. And again, it's free for, I think a week or so, which might be ending at the end of this week or the middle of this week. There's a Fallout bundle sale, which comes with basically everything for $55, you know, and you gotta love these Steam discounts, negative 77% out of $244 originally cut down to 55 bucks. You really can't beat it. And if you're not looking to collect the whole collection of every Fallout game here with all of its DLCs, it looks like, um, I mean, you can get um, Fallout 4 for five bucks. It's a really good deal. The VR version, 15 bucks. Um, you know, DLCs are all discounted if you haven't gotten to those. Uh, and New Vegas right here, $2.50 for, you know, arguably one of the best Fallout games ever made. Um, what a steal, you know? So I think a lot of people are picking these up and that's um, added to that concurrent player base. So you love to see it. Um, a very good video adaptation feeding back into the medium in a positive way so people can experience this stuff um, and, and you know grow their appreciation or their understanding of those worlds and those characters even more. So really fun. Uh, I just, I've had a lot of fun with the Fallout show and you know there's a good adaptation of a video game show when people are doing stuff like this. Uh, this is a VG247 article. Where's the byline? <laughs> written by, oh, here it is, written by Mark Warren, a senior staff writer, who wrote, uh, the Fallout TV show includes a big map of vaults, and you can now check it out as a cool interactive Google Earth overlay. Now, I'm not going to get into spoilers, but essentially there's a shot in the show of where all of the Fallout vaults in the United States are located. Somebody took that, uh, kicking things off, Fallout content creator Nikki, who goes by the handle Tunnel Snake Fool and is currently studying a master's degree in geography, quickly decided to turn the big map of the U.S. vaults, which you can see in the background of an important meeting at Vault Tech during the show's final episode, into something folks could interact with a bit easier. She took screenshots of the map, added geo references to all the vaults it shows, and then pulled it into Google Earth. So you can kind of see what they did here. You can kind of see the shot. There's the all the vaults, and so now in like you know, real time, you can kind of see where all the vaults would be located and what it would take to travel from one to another. And some of these vaults you're probably going to recognize from the games and are referenced in the games uh, and what's going on at each of them. So that's really cool. The other really fun one, which I saw pop up on Twitter, uh, and this is noted by Eurogamers, uh, uh, Victoria Kennedy, who wrote the headline, uh, Fallout fans are trying to estimate Lucy's XP level 
following the TV show finale. Now, I'm not going to get into spoilers again, but I will give you the highlights here. Fallout TV series fans are trying to estimate the in-game character level its protagonist Lucy might have reached by the end of the show's first season, which is really fun. If you've played Fallout games or Bethesda games, you know just by doing things in these worlds, you gain experience for sneaking or for combat. Whatever, you're, whatever activity generally you're doing, you will get rewarded with XP. So that makes it really fun for viewers of the show to be able to map that to the game or to as if Lucy was an in-game character and how much uh, XP she would have. Um, and so what they deduced is actually really funny. Um, they, uh, while some fans say Lucy could be quote anywhere from level 12 to 17, the majority seem to feel she would likely be less than that and probably under level this under level 10. This is because of the perceived number of side quests she does, her lack of combat. Uh, someone said she gonna die if she run she gonna die if she run into robots, mutants, or death claws. I mean, pretty much, mostly everybody dies in the first half of that game if you run into those things, um, if you're not experienced. And uh, you know the locations she discovered. So by exploring more, you can also get XP. But but yeah, that that's basically the gist of it. Just to talk a little bit more about the Fallout show. Uh, it is kind of gory, so it's not necessarily something you're going to show to your kids or anything like that. Uh, it, it, like the games, it, it, it does follow that kind of dark humor a lot of the time, but there's kind of these three main characters we're following around between Lucy, uh, the ghoul, uh, who's played by Walt Goggins, and then, of course, um, uh, Maximus, who's uh, part of the Brotherhood of Steel. And there's really interesting character development here and relationships between these characters that really do connect throughout the series and throughout the kind of uh, different timelines where the show is exploring different things that are happening. The characters, they kind of nailed the performances, they nailed the tone, which I think is like, would have been the hardest thing to do and, and kind of the way people interact with the world just is really nailed by the show. And the last thing I'll say is that I, I think it was a really hard feat to do, you know, like some of it is obviously set design and, um, you know, costume design and that stuff. But since there's so much reference material from, you know, just the decades of, of Fallout game creation, I think there's a lot of reference for the, the showrunners to provide. And they just had to tap that. And it's not like other producers in Hollywood and other directors and things couldn't do that with other games. So it's really, really cool to have a new benchmark for very good video game adaptations here. I think in that world, there's like a lot more people running around than you generally see in a Fallout game, but uh, you know, it's a show so you can do that. Uh, but yeah, overall, I enjoyed it, highly recommend it. All right, let's get into our next story here real quick. Skybound's latest crowdfunding campaign aims to raise money to develop a new Invincible game. Now, reportedly, this is a triple-A game. This is a story on IGN by Taylor Lyles. Uh, it says, Skybound Entertainment has announced a crowdfunding campaign to develop a new game set in the Invincible universe. Now, they say that they've announced this, but I haven't actually seen an official press release for this. What we have is this republic.com a funding page where you know it looks very official i think this is official there's no reason to really doubt it but it's very strange because on the skybound website there's nothing about the official announcement of a triple a invincible game uh this is like this this is the skybound homepage, and if you even go to like the invincible kind of sub page and um you look for like the most recent stories there's nothing in here. Invincible news. You know, there's the, the Fortnite kind of event where you can fight sequids um, and different things going on. And then there's like a Adam Eve game, I think. Uh, so, but, but other than that, there really isn't any news about it. If you check the, um, if you check the Skybound or here, this is Robert Kirkman, the creator of Invincible. This is his Twitter account. He hasn't mentioned anything about a AAA Invincible game, nor has the official Skybound Entertainment Twitter account. So um, it's it's strange the way that this is kind of being reported and handled, I will just say. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't some kind of like litmus test where they're trying to see how much money they can raise for this. And again, this isn't Kickstarter or like Indiegogo or something like this. This is on Republic.com, which, you know, on its face looks to be kind of a more like grown up investor type of platform. And if you look in businesses, they're like involved with Web3 stuff and they basically providing, you know, growth capital solutions and all that. This is like a very... Uh, business, 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 synergy, blah, 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 kind of, uh, kind of a deal. 
which is fascinating, right? This is probably a place where people with a lot more money are investing in different projects and things. Like, I think you can even invest in like Skybound Entertainment. Um, you know, there's growth projection and stuff on here. This is just kind of wild. But yeah, this is kind of the equivalent to a Kickstarter. It's raised uh, $446,000. For a AAA game, that is a drop in the bucket. You're looking at $100, $200 million you need to do that. Um, it looks like they've already raised um, about $18 million um, across 6,000 people. <laughs> so, yeah, other types of investors with money trying to, to invest in this thing. Um, but still, that's like, you know, $18 million plus 400000 Still got a long ways to go if they're going to fund this thing or find more funding for this thing. So I, I'm not sure how much I believe in this. People are already talking about like, I hope this game is good. And it's like, man, this barely seems like an idea, right? Um, here's like a quick rundown of the pitch. Um, oh, quick credit to, oh yeah, I did credit Taylor Lyle. So quick credit. Um, it said Skybound said the, f the funds will be used to develop a AAA title based on the comic book series created by Robert Kirkman. The campaign, which launched today, has already surpassed its fundraising goal of $50,000 with over $450,000 currently raised at the time of writing. The campaign is scheduled to conclude on April 30th. And this is like where it gets even weirder. Like, what is $50,000 for a AAA game, which is going to cost between $100 and $200 million to make, maybe more? Um, they're saying like the team is of about 30 people. Um, and so like $50,000 wouldn't even pay... Like one of those people for a year triple a games take multiple years to, to to play and this is something we see with crowdfunding a lot where um where fifty thousand dollars is maybe the goal but they just put that so that the goal can succeed you know and then they can claim the money after so as long as they got over fifty thousand they're gonna be happy i'm sure they were well aware they were gonna get more than that um the other thing about republic.com is there doesn't really seem to be stretch goals or anything like that so it's just basically like you believe in the product or you don't and you invest but yeah, right here it says a AAA game studio with industry vets from EA, Activision, Blizzard, and Amazon Games. 30 plus employees developing our first in-house AAA game based on Invincible. Um, Invincible games from US Fortnite, uh, Guarding the Globe, Ubisoft, Adam Eve. Invincible Season 2 rated 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Skybound previously raised $18 million on Republic uh, from 6,000 people, 90 million fans globally. Partners include Netflix, Amazon, Universal, Epic Games. Video games industry expected to reach. So like, yeah, I'm just, this whole thing is kind of strange to me, kind of baffling, uh, but it is happening, it, so it sounds like. It looks like they're gonna make an Invincible game. No description about like what kind of game it's gonna be, how it's gonna work, if there's gonna be any kind of progression, or it's open world or like a narrative driven action game. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine like turning Invincible into a game like obviously there's a lot of different heroes in that universe and villains and, and you could make a video game surely but you know a large part of Invincible is kind of the the storytelling and kind of the twist, twists on the storytelling and like specifically the 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 arc of Invincible himself and his relationship with his father and stuff like that so you know if the story just kind of takes place in that universe or it's a retelling of the comic or the show uh, it doesn't seem as strong to me. I don't know, I, I, but it could be great, I guess. I, not not to just poo-poo it right away, but uh, yeah. And then there was this mishap where on that page, there was a reference to Invincible season four and five renewal, seeming revealed by now deleted crowdfunding campaign message. That campaign message was deleted. Oh yeah, there's an update, right? Where IGN said, <laughs> they basically had this update here where it says, um, update, and it's kind of buried. I don't like the way this was done. Uh, let me change that color so you can see it. Update. A source tells IGN that rumors of Invincible being renewed for Season 4 and Season 5 are not accurate. Um, so, yeah. So, according to IGN, they heard from somewhere that, like, you know, Season 4 and Season 5 are not officially renewed yet. It's a very popular series and people tend to love it or seem to love it. It's critically acclaimed. I'd have a hard time imagining that a Season 4 and 5 don't get renewed depending on what they do with the story in season three which like i think the director and the creators have been on record saying like every episode they want to feel like a season finale kind of a deal so one i wouldn't be surprised if it gets pushed season three gets pushed and two um <laughs> i honestly wouldn't be surprised if this video game for invincible actually doesn't end up happening um but we'll, we'll see 
Skybound. Uh, oh yeah, so I wanted to show you guys some of the responses here. This is Wario64 who posts a lot of video game news and deals. And kind of the initial response to this hasn't been super positive. Uh, Freshly is a pawn, not the Arisen, says, Why do they need our money? Crown-funded AAA game, the ghost of Western Gaming's future has appeared to me before. And that's going to the Kyle's, our style. Um, just a lot of memes and a lot of this kind of like Robert Kirkman is a billionaire obviously creator of Walking Dead has a lot of money and could you know make this game happen if he really wanted to or believed in it and wanted to make a game um, this person also saying they can't see how Invincible would translate into a game uh, and this uh, tweet from Kyle says I can't imagine Robert Kirkman and Skybound needs a crowdfunding campaign to raise money for this Right, like it's an established franchise, and you know it's it's created and run by the guy who made Walking Dead, a multi, multi, multi million dollar franchise that has a long running t television series and you know very successful comic book show series. So, yeah, just a lot of people here also being skeptical of the crowdfunding and guess that Amazon money is going to the anti Matt, oh the celebrity voice actors. Uh, so that's other people saying that's not an approach I would do. I'm going by folks. Uh, reactions for good reason they have plenty of internal funds plus 18 million already for the project which if going AAA is very underfunded at this stage yeah like I said kind of agree crowdfunding campaign to raise money to develop a AAA game something about that sounds wrong can't quite put my finger on it hmm. so yeah it, it's just more of this it, it, you can scroll down and see a lot of this but but yeah <laughs> and this person just Good old Jim here saying, if you're calling your game AAA, then you shouldn't need to crowdfund it. I mean, because it just really takes so much money. And, and to, to get to the level of cash you would need, uh, you need like double fine levels, right, of, of crowdfunding and belief in your, your kind of product here. <sighs> Seems like a stretch. All right, that's probably enough naysaying on, on Invincible Game. It'd be cool to see. I'm really enjoying the show. Um, excited for season three. Uh, you know, I was a little, a little bit more down on the on the finale of season two, but all in all, it's, it's a really, really solid show. So if you haven't seen or read Invincible, you should check those out. And lastly, let's jump into our last story for today, which I think is the fall good, the feel good story of this of this day of this week. I don't know if I'll make another one of these this week, but let's say this is the feel good story. Uh, this article comes by way of Chris Scullion over at VGC, who wrote, Lawbreakers 2.0 fan project makes Cliff Blazinski's dead first-person shooter playable again after six years. The former Gears of War designer has been promoting the new launcher on Twitter. I'm not going to call it X. It's still Twitter.com. Get out of here. An official fan-made launcher for Lawbreakers has made the game playable again for the first time in six years. Developed by the now-defunct developer Bosky Productions and directed by former Gears of War designer Cliff Blazinski, Lawbreakers was released in August 2017. Despite mostly positive reception from critics, however, the game was shut down just one year later in 2018, the low player count cited as the main reason. Yeah, I remember they made Lawbreakers and then they released it and then they had like a battle royale game, I forget what it was called, very 80s inspired that that they were also working on and they tried to get that out. And I'm not actually sure what happened to that one, but uh, both, I think, projects were eventually kind of shut down. Although Blazinski made it clear a year ago that he wanted Publisher Nexon to bring Lawbreakers back, nothing official has been announced. Um, instead, a group of fans have released Lawbreakers 2.0, an official launcher for the game. Blazinski has been linking to the project on Twitter and interacting with its players on its Discord server. The new launcher, which makes it clear that it's not affiliated with Nexon or the Lawbreakers brand in any way, shape, or form, lets players boot the dormant game on Steam and play online multiplayer matches again, which it was a kind of a hero shooter, if you don't remember, uh, in the wake of Overwatch, but it had a lot a faster pace, I want to say, and some wild abilities where you could like swing under stages and, um, you know, different hero abilities and stuff. It just had like, uh, I don't want to go as far as to say an edgy style, almost like because it was kind of cheesy in some ways, but kind of awesome in other ways. Um, but anyways, th there's been a lot of good reception for this, as pointed out in this article on VGC. Um, Mayor Reynolds TV said, playing Lawbreakers from Legendary, the Cliffy B was incredible. We need more fast paced, badass, high octane arena shooters like this. The revival team has done an incredible job. I hope that Nexon notices the passion and gives it a proper revival. Kiyotaka also wrote on Twitter, got about three hours of Lawbreakers today and was absolutely blown away. It reignited my love for the hero shooter genre that was kind of lost with Overwatch 2 and the absolute legend himself, the real Cliffy B, joined the Discord. This game is legit. Blazinski 
revealed that he had discovered the Lawbreaker's IP was still owned by Nexon and called on the company CEO to speak with him about it. I think this was last year. Clarifying his intentions in further tweets, Blazinski said he wasn't interested in actively creating a new game, but said he'd be willing to consult on any potential revival. So yeah, I think there's some hope there that this thing that they built could continue to exist and live on. Um, and Boss Keys basically shut down from what I understand. Cliff Blazinski's writing comic books now. It's a sad fate for any game where developers worked really hard on it and then they released it and then it just kind of evaporates from there. Um, absolutely sucks. So it's cool to see a fan project like this where people are really passionate about this game, want it to continue to exist. So they did their own work to bring the servers back up. I can show you the official page for it is here. Lawbreakers. Oh, uh, relb.org. You can find it here. Play Lawbreakers. You basically just download this thing and then, um, you can run it on Steam once, I believe. Let's see. Add this folder as an uh, exception in your antivirus settings if it sees that it's dangerous. Open the launcher and click patch so that all items show a green check mark. And then run Lawbreakers once from Steam before attempting to launch from here. Then basically uh, you run this launcher and then you can just play the Steam version of Lawbreakers, it seems like, which is pretty cool. All right, that is going to do it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying Fallout. I hope you're enjoying all these different games we have to play. Um, I didn't get into the story about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth sales being low. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's it, it's on track, according to a uh, video game analyst, Daniel Ahmad, uh, that it's going to sell less than Final Fantasy VII Remake, maybe about half, and then have even a shorter tail. However, Square Enix is committed to releasing the third part in the series, which should be out, about out in, in like three years or something like that. Um, but yeah, that was the last story that I had just rattling up in my brain. Interesting stuff. I think that it sold like two, a little over 2 million copies or something, probably like 2.2 million, I think was what I saw, uh, based on the estimates by Daniel Maud. Um, who said it was like during in this time frame or something similar to this time frame had sold like about half as much as Final Fantasy VII Remake. So uh, I guess that's the last story for today. <laughs> All right, you can't stop me. I'm just going to keep going if I don't stop recording. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in my next video, I guess, at some point. Leave comments, tell me what you think about the news, tell me if you want more videos about news and I'll see what I can do. All right, take care. See you later.